Welcome to the Radiant Visalia podcast. Join us at one of our two services, 9 a.m. and 1045 a.m. Download the Church Center app or visit our website, radiantvisalia.com, to stay connected with us. All right, enjoy. study of uh, First Timothy, which is a book written by the Apostle Paul. That guy wrote more than half of your New Testament, and he planted churches, which planted churches, which planted churches, which planted churches, and now we're here. That guy. Really? Yeah. And he planted a church in Ephesus, and then he left to plant another church. And when he left, he put Timothy, a young pastor, in place. And so he's now writing to Timothy because Timothy's facing some challenges as a young pastor. And so Paul's writing to him, and that's why this letter from Paul bears the name uh, First uh, Timothy. And if you want to, you can open to First Timothy chapter 1. I'm going to read from verse 12 to verse 17 of chapter 1. We're in a section of 1 Timothy where Paul's going to share his testimony. I want to hear what's going on for Kanye. Sounds profound. Well, this is what happened for Paul. This was his conversion. And he he shares it with this church. Starting in verse 12 of chapter 1. I thank him who has given me strength, Christ Jesus our Lord, because he judged me faithful, appointing me to his service. Though formerly I was a blasphemer, a persecutor, an insolent opponent, but I received mercy because I had acted ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord overflowed for me with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the foremost. But I received mercy for this reason, that in me, as the foremost, Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience as an example to those who were to believe in him for eternal life. Paul's saying here that God saved him so that others would say, if God can save him, he can save me. That guy? If God could change that guy, then maybe there's a chance for me. God could change me. Maybe God would save me. Maybe God would want me. If God wants that guy, and God was patient with that guy, then maybe God would be patient with me. And then Paul, after sharing his testimony of receiving mercy, bursts out and prays to the king of the ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. We've come to this book as a church. The reason we're studying it is just we've been asking the question, how can we do church God's way? Not my way or your way. I know what your way is. I know what my way is. God, this is your house. The church is your household. How do you want to do church and how can we do church God's way? That's the question we've been living in. And remember, this book has a lot to say about how and why we do church. And Paul is saying here as he shares his testimony in no uncertain terms that to do God's, to do church God's way involves mercy and this being a place for people who are in need. If this is not a place for people who are in need, this is not God's place. My house will be a place of mercy. 
I want those who need mercy to find mercy in my house, in my church. So if we're going to do church God's way, we talked about doing it by building relationships. We've talked about sound doctrine for a couple weeks and the importance of that. But let's not forget, as we're trying to dot our I's and cross our T's and getting in arguments about what's in pencil, what's in ink, and what's in blood, let's not forget the whole point of this is that we have received mercy. We've received mercy. And this is a place for people who are in need. Mercy. Simply Paul's saying, I did not get what I deserved. I deserved this, and I got that. I deserved this, and God did not treat me as my sins deserved. I received mercy, but I received mercy. One thing I would want you to know this morning, which may fly in the face of what you actually believe about God, is that God delights to show mercy. Most of us, I'm afraid, have an idea of God where it's like, all right. Like we wore him down. And so he's like, you know what, just don't worry about it. I'm tired. Scripture says that he delights to show mercy. He woke up this morning. Sorry, that's not correct. He doesn't sleep. Speaking of sound doctrine. His mercy knew this morning. He delights to show it for those who need it. For those who are in need and recognize their need for a Savior. Guess what, baby? You get one. You get one. He loves to show mercy. And that's a little different. It's a little different than me. I love when people like get what's coming to them. Take like great joy in it. He's not like us. I love it when I tell one of my daughters, don't lean back in your chair. Don't lean back in your chair. Don't lean back in your chair. I told you not to lean back in your chair. And if you're looking for sympathy from me, you're not going to get it. You got what you deserved. (laughs) That's us. Our God delights to show mercy. Psalm 103 would be uh, worth reading. Just to announce who our God is, and then we're going to have people share their testimonies. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. He will not accuse, he will not always accuse, nor will he harbor his anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far as he removed our transgressions from us. As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. For he knows how we are formed. And he remembers that we are dust. Paul says in this passage, I was the worst. I was the worst. I did some dumb, dumb stuff. But God, but God who is rich in mercy found me. And then it just overflows into praise. It goes from testimony to doxology where he's telling his story of mercy and then he just can't help but to just bubble over. And if you've read Paul's writing, this happens often. To him who's able, you know, just right in the middle of it. And so he's like, this is what God did for me. And then he breaks into praise to the king of the ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. You don't know what he did for me. 
Have you ever had like, have you ever overflowed into worship? Uh, like a spontaneous thing. Not like Monica told me to stand and then the screen told me what to say. But something else was prompting you and words came from inside of you. Has that ever happened to you? Well, thank God. Where you're reflecting, you're remembering, you're paying attention, you're realizing afresh, oh, I deserved this and I got that. Oh, praise God. Praise God for his work in my life. I deserve death and I got life. Has that ever happened in the shower? What about in the car? Man. I hope that that happens to you in the shower or your car. If the only time you stand and overflow and worship is when someone tells you to stand, say these things. Here, you know, like what if that was your relationship? Someone constantly coaching me, say this to your wife. Tiffany, I love you. You mean the world to me. You know. Now sit. Okay. And stand again. Say this. Tiffany. I couldn't do my life without you. Tiffany, I couldn't do my life without you. Listen, I think this is important because we don't always feel it. But man, there should be a spontaneous overflow of worship as we reflect on his mercy and what he's done for us. So we're going to do that this morning. We're just going to have people testify. This has been God's mercy in my life. And then we're all just going to stand up and worship. I figured we could talk about what happened for Paul and talk about this passage we could talk about the menu or we could just order and we could just eat it together and I just thought I'd rather do that I'd rather if you're a Christian you have a testimony of mercy you deserved one thing and you got another that's your story so as people share and they say this is my story well it's not just their story this is our story this is our song together, right? And so in the same way that you attend weddings and you start thinking, man, I made those vows. I wonder how that's going. You know, like you go to weddings and you think about your own marriage. As people share their stories, would you find yourself in it and go, man, I'm the recipient of mercy. Would you reflect again on how good and gracious God's been to you? Josie, would you come? And then Monica's just going to lead us and we're just going to worship. We're going to do what Paul did. Um, rather than talk about what Paul did. A couple things. I just would want you to be really encouraging of everyone who shares, because even if it's not good, it's really hard to stand up here and grab the mic. And people are being vulnerable and exposing their lives and their needs. So it really doesn't matter what happens uh, in here. Uh, we're we're going to honor and appreciate and encourage those who uh, lead us this morning. So good luck, Josie. Hello. Good morning. For whatever reason, I always feel like I have to say my age. I'm 38. Anywho, um, I grew up in a house that did not know Jesus as Lord or did not know God in that sense. Um, and I lived that way. There was a lot of abuse in my home, um, a lot. Just every shade you can think of, it happened in my household. And uh, at 15 years old, I started to use drugs. Uh, methamphetamine was a drug of choice for me. I really, really liked doing it. I got hooked as soon as I started. And it lasted about eight years. Actually, it lasted eight years of me living that party scene, me being involved with all that, just that whole spectrum of partying, drugs, alcohol, like all of that, that's what that's what I did. And, and I actually really liked it. It, it. it wasn't like, you know, there's people that get drunk because they're sad. I did, I wasn't that person. Like I liked to have fun. I was loud. It was just really fun for me to do that kind of lifestyle. Uh, at 23 years old, the guy, the people that I would party with got saved. And I was like, cool for you. That's good. I don't want, you know, I, I'm having fun. I was having fun. Like I said, I, and 
sure enough, I, after a month, I kind of got bored, and I was like, I want my friends back, <laughs> you know? So I went to church not because I was tired of sin or I was convicted. I went to recruit my friends to come back. And um, I was very curious why a person would give up. The, one of the guys that got saved, he would sell drugs. And uh, I just thought he gave up authority. He gave up money, friends, and girls because with that lifestyle, you get those things really easily. And I was very curious, why would you give up that authority for someone that's dead? You know, like that, that was my, so curiosity took me to church. Um, I went a couple of times and I just remember uh, one, one Sunday I didn't go because I had partied the night before. And the following Wednesday, I went to this little church. It's a little Hispanic church in the corner of Porterville. And, um, and this lady looks at me and finds me in the restroom and says, like, hey, I didn't see you here on Wednesday. I didn't see you here on Sunday. Um, what happened? And I told her, oh, my mom had a doctor's appointment. I needed to take her, blah, blah, blah. I just lied to her. And then uh, she, she said, well, hopefully we see you next Sunday. Bye. And that was it. That was all she said. And I just remember standing in that restroom and almost, like, shaking and wondering, what the heck? How did she notice me not here? I'm just a, I'm just a visitor. Like, why would you notice me not here? And um, I didn't realize then, but I realize now that she was speaking value over me because of the stuff that I lived with and the stuff that I was involved with and the stuff I did. She just said I mattered. I mattered that I wasn't there. And I didn't know it then. I know it now that the, his word says that he's a man that comes and knocks on the door of our hearts. And for the first time, I heard that tap. I believe that he's knocked all my life. But at 23 years old, I heard that tap that I mattered. So it made me want to come back. There was this man, the pastor was preaching, and they said, God's a God that talks. And I said, all right, yeah, sure, you know. And they said, come up here if you don't. And they, like, challenged you. So I went up there, and I thought, like, I'm going to go tell them this. This doesn't work, blah, blah, blah. So... I went up there, and as I stood there, and I was kind of wondering, like, what's average time you stay up? When should I go back? And uh, I just heard a voice inside of me, and this voice said, Josie. And first of all, he called me by my name. I heard it within me. He said, Josie, for I know everything you brag about. I'm ab about how much guys you've hooked up with, about how much drugs you can do, and how much things you think you got away with. And then he said, and I know everything you wish nobody finds out about you. And I knew he was talking about the abuse, and I knew he was talking about education because education has always been hard for me. And he goes, and I love you. And this thing stirred something inside of my gut. It, it, it was like an encounter with, I did not know what, I just remember I wanted to get out to smoke a cigarette. And... Um, <laughs> I, like a couple of weeks later, I got I, the church took me to a family camp or an encounter camp deal, and I went for three days and I was up there and everything was cool, but I wasn't like, I, I just, it was like whatever. And it was the last night and I'm sitting in the back and I said, okay, 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 God, I'm not gonna lie. I know that you you're real. I hear you and you're talking to me and I know you can hear me too. I said I don't know how all this stuff is gonna work. Like I'll give you sex, I'll give you cigarettes, and I'll give you music, but let me keep math. Let me just, twice a week, maybe, twice a week, that's all I want. And uh, people usually laugh at that, but no one's ever taught me how to hear the voice of God or how you're supposed to talk to him. So I was kind of bargaining with him. And he just said, I said, I don't know how this is going to work. I just know that I want to follow you for the rest of my life. And I was 23 years old when I said that prayer. And I am th 38 now, and I've never went back to the stuff that I've been involved with. And... I'll, I'll sum it to this is that he picked me when I wasn't looking for him. You guys, I was not hungry for him. I didn't feel bad. I wasn't convicted. I wasn't lonely and rejected in a corner. I was living life, and he called me by name. and took, put, he, It's like I didn't try out for the team, and they said, hey, come be part of the team. And I, that's why I love the scripture that said, while I was yet a sinner, Christ died for me. He didn't wait for me to make a decision to come after him. He came after me. And to me, that's God's mercy over my life. And it's triggered all the way to now. It's not like there's one encounter and then I'm done. I will go, go, go. And I do a lot. Like I'm working. I do all the, I like to hang out. And then I won't stop. I won't stop and read my Bible. I won't stop and pray. And I'll go, go, go. And then I feel bad. Because it's like when you have that friend that you say, hey, 
we're going to meet up and you show up and they don't come. Oh, I do that. I'll say, we're going to meet up tomorrow. I'm going to stay, I'm going to read my Bible tomorrow. And the week passes. And then when I finally do show up, I'm kind of like, sorry, God. Like, I, like, feel bad about showing up. And he meets me with love. And it's his mercy. It is his mercy that leads me to repent. His mercy causes me not to take that long to meet with him again. And I'm just very grateful for God's mercy over my life. And it's just been him. It's just been his mercy that calls me back. It makes me want to show up again. Good stuff. Um, I'm going to approach um, mercy from a slightly different uh, perspective. Um, and I, when I received the call from uh, Mark, um, he said, well, I, you know, I need you to pray about what you're going to talk. I said, I already know what I'm going to do, didn't I? <laughs> well, I need you to pray about it anyway. Okay, I so I, <laughs> I sat down um, to think the beginning of this thing through, and I said, well, what, what does mercy look like? What does man's mercy for another person look like as opposed to uh, God's mercy? And... <clears throat> My example of uh, man's mercy is um, that people will show um, compassionate treatment for those who are in distress. And God is a blessing that is an act of divine favor or compassion. Divine. So you know when it happens, who the source is, and it's without debate. So <clears throat> I think the greatest story of, of uh, my wife Janet and um, myself experiencing mercy, both of man and God, took place about 17 years ago. It was in 2002, and it was the worst year of our life, ever. It started with a uh, loss. The nicest man I ever met in my whole life just happened to be uh, Janet's father. His name was Bus. He was always happy. It was wonderful to be around him, and no matter what, you wanted to do. You could just say, hey, let's go do it. Yeah, okay, go. He was good to go. Good to go. But he died of heart failure on February 8th, 2002. And it was like losing a, a second father. Um, and his passing um, was deeply felt. Uh, and two weeks later, on February, February 22nd, the friendliest man I've ever known in my whole life, and my hero, my father died from complications of Alzheimer's. And I felt like one of the, the greatest anchors in my life was gone, and there was a hole there, and nobody else could fill that. Three weeks later, on March 17th, my brother-in-law, Thomas Sawyer, died of colon cancer. But before that event, I had the privilege and the honor of leading him to Jesus Christ and his saving grace. And just a couple of days before he died, he called Janet and I. He was in tears. He knew he was dying but we were able to both encourage him and tell him, you will have no more pain, you will have no more suffering, you'll finally go home, and I'll see you there later. 
people often say that good things or bad things come in threes. That's a lie. <laughs> On April 6th, 2002, our 15-year-old son, Justin, his two best friends and a very good friend of mine named Pat Carey um, were all killed in a plane crash in the Sequoia National Forest. And <clears throat> I witnessed firsthand that it was, in fact, the largest uh, search mission um, in California history. And they had taken this flight. It was given to um, one of Justin's friends, Bobby Crane, as his 16th birthday uh, gift. We, along with the other families, had to wait four excruciating days before the the crash site was actually found. There were no survivors. Justin owned Janet's heart, and now he was gone. And we actually felt like we were dying too. I felt like my guts had been ripped out. And I didn't know how I was ever going to be made whole again. And I was very, very afraid that I might even lose the love of my life, Janet. The pain isn't just physical, it's mental, it's emotional, it's constant, and it's overwhelming. It has been said that a father's hope is in his son, and now where were we to find that hope? Justin was the kind of young man that a parent dreams of. A wonderful, wonderful young man. And we still dream about him. For those first four days of anxious waiting, our home was completely filled with friends, people from church, long-term friends, people we'd known um, for a long time. And they stayed day and night. They all slept on the floor, wherever they could lay down. You know, we just threw out blankets and pillows and sleeping bags, and it was wall-to-wall -wall people. They cooked our meals, they intercepted our phone calls, they held us in their arms while we cried. And we prayed continuously. This care for us in our greatest time of need is what I mean by man's grace and mercy. Now I want to tell you a couple of miraculous things that God did to show us mercy and remind us that he was intimately involved in this tragedy. But he would not allow it to go without bringing glory to himself and start healing for Janet and I. I was um, up in the mountains um, every day for those first four days. And I, I remember clearly watching this giant uh, rescue helicopter from uh, Vandenberg Air Base flying really low. And then it phew, turned around five minutes later and was getting out as fast as it could. And I walked down to, uh, to where my car was parked and there was a friend of mine standing uh, by the car. And as soon as I saw his face, I knew, I knew they were all gone. And I, I, I literally collapsed right in the middle of the highway. I couldn't move. So my friends picked me up, put me in my car, helped me wash off my face. And we drove in silence uh, 
down from Potwisha until we got right to where the intersection is to go down to Exeter. And I heard God's voice so clearly. And then he said, Stephen, I'm going to give you power for everyone. And I, I turn and I look at the other guys and I say, hey, did you hear that? Hear what? Uh, God just told me he was going to uh, make me strong for, for everyone. Immediately, three sets of hands come over and, you know, they're touching me and going, it's going to be okay. You, you, you'll be all right. I was like, no. no. I, in fact, uh, I, I don't want to go home. No, you have to go home. Janet's going to be there. Your daughter's going to be there. There's still a number of friends, and you need I said, wait a minute. I told you God was speaking to me, and God also said, go to the Visalia airport. And they're like, what, what do you want to go to the airport for? I said, just do it. It's not me saying it. God said it. Okay. So they drive to the airport, and as soon as we get to the entrance, I realize why God said that, because the only person that I saw was Janet standing underneath the tree by herself. So I got out of the car, walked over, we held each other, then we took each other's hands and we renewed our vows. And those vows included, I will never leave you, I will never forsake you, I will be with you during this entire struggle and God will be with us. We're not in it alone. The second thing that happened was four days later we had a memorial service. Over 3,000 people attended. And it was a long service. It was like two hours. Um, yeah. So as soon as it was done, I, I took um, Janet and our daughter home, and I put them both to bed. And I went into my office in the dark and just sat and, what do I do now, God? What do I do? And the phone rang. And I thought, oh, okay. So I pick it up. There's a young man on the other end, and he says, are you Mr. McLean? I said, yes. He says, well, <clears throat> God asked me to call you. Okay. Um, what would you like to tell me? He said, I was the crew chief on the Vandenberg helicopter that found the crash site. But the way that it happened, we knew that God was completely intimately involved in it. See, as they flew up the first time and I saw them, um, when they got up to what's called Red's Meadow, uh, a fog bank came in that was, you know, several hundred feet high. And the pilot says, we've got to get out of here because we won't be able to see anything. So... All six members of the crew are Christians. And other than the pilot and the spotters in the back, they, they were all on their knees begging God to do a miracle so that they could find the crash site and we could start to have some closure and healing. And um, they got an answer. So just at the, about the time they're coming down to uh, Lake Kauia, um, the crew chief yells to the pilot, and he says, turn around. He goes, we can't turn around. You can't see. And he goes, God said to turn around. Oh, well, I'll turn around then. So they, <laughs> they flew back, and when they came just within a, a few yards of this giant fog bank that had been roaring down like a river, it stopped and started going the other way as fast as that helicopter 
could trace it. That doesn't happen. And about halfway up um, the canyon with the Kauai, it takes a left turn, and then the, there's a false canyon that is a dead-end canyon that goes a uh, different direction, closer to uh, Mineral King. And when they got to that divide, the, the first giant wall of fog stopped. And then the fog bank that was up the Falls Canyon started moving up as fast as the helicopter could chase it. You know where it stopped, don't you? Exactly at the crash site. And this gentleman told me, he said, Miss McLean, I saw you on television and I know that you're a man of God. And I knew that, that you would um, want to know that God was involved in the midst of your tragedy. And he, uh, he tethered down to the wreck. To, uh, they threw in you know, blankets and sleeping bags and food and a flashlight. And he spent the night with the boys and Pat Carey. And I wouldn't have known that it happened that way, which is a miracle. Our God and Jesus has calmed the storm before. And he was in the process of beginning to calm the storm in Janet and my heart, mind, and soul. And I will ever be grateful. Thank you, Jesus. I love you. All right. Good day, church. For those of you that don't know me, my name is J.R. Robertson. And, um, you know, when Mark called me last week to ask if I wanted to do this, I was trying to figure out a way to get out of it. And, um, you know, but as I begun to reflect on it, you know, I think, I think God softened my heart and said, hey, you have, a, you have a really good, victorious story, and you need to share it. And um, so then I started to get into planning mode, and being an Enneagram 3, my first version was really, really great of this thing. So, um, but then having an, a, an 8 as a wife, you know, she kind of really set me down and said, you got to be real. So... Here, here it is. Um, you know, I grew up in the church. Um, you know, I knew about God, but I did not have my own relationship with God. And so, you know, as I got older, you know, and got into high school and college, you know, that lack of relationship really began to send me down a path that, you know, was very rebellious. And so, you know, in college, I, I became very promiscuous. I I uh, used and sold drugs. Um, you know, I flunked out of college for a time, and you know, obviously nothing that I'm proud of. Um, and you know, when I finished school, I moved to San Francisco to you know, really begin a career and and you know find validation in the world. You know, through success, and um, you know that that validation you know, took me into all kinds of places that I didn't want to be in, and, and I'd strive, and, you know, you know, I would run over anyone who got in my way, and, you know, just wasn't a good guy. I was a good guy, but I wasn't a good guy, you know, and um, so I did that for 10 years in the Bay Area, and, um, you know, really just chasing my dreams and trying to find validation, and, you know, until one day I was gifted a book called The Purpose Driven Life. And, you know, I, I think if God can work through anything, he is working through a book, right, which is, you know, great. Um, but it broke me. It broke me in a way that, um, you know, I hadn't been broken before. And it opened my eyes to, you know, God's desire for my life. And um, that book got me into church, and I ended up getting baptized and, I broke up with the girlfriend that I was with, and I moved out. We were living together at the time, stopped partying, um, and 
God gave me someone, that, you know, a guy from work who said, hey, come move in with me. You can have my bed. And he gave me his bed for six months. And uh, he slept on the couch. And he taught me how to pray. And he taught me how to uh, read the Bible and to understand God's word. And, you know, it was a real gift at that point in time. Um, and, you know, again, just another uh, another part of God's mercy is just that alone. Um, so I, I, you know, in, in that time, I really felt God calling me back to Visalia. And, you know, obviously coming from the Bay Area and having a really great job at the time, I was like, well, what am I going to do in Visalia? I'm not a farmer and I'm not a teacher. So, you know, what am I going to do? <laughs> so, um, so I moved back with no job, no money, you know, no identity. And um, I landed here at Radiant, and um, you know, I'd, I'd known Travis for a long time, and just, you know, we were real small uh, at, the, at the time, and it was just a perfect place for me uh, in, this, in this stage of life. And I remember sitting one Sunday, I had um, moved back, I was just doing kind of odd in jobs, and I had made, I think, 300 bucks for the month, and I was literally doing you know, apartment cleanup, so I had to wear hazmat suits, and it was, it was bad, and so I'm looking at, you know, the money in my wallet going, man, I worked really, really hard for this, I know that I need to give some back to God, and I had two 40s in my pocket, and I was like, okay, I'm, I'm either going to cheap God out and only give him 20, or I'm going to go and have to put 40 in and take 10 out, or, you know, I, I didn't know what I was going to do, um, but in that moment, like, God just spoke to me, and he said, I- I'm going to be generous in your life, uh, and I want you to be generous, too. And so um, I put the 40 in. So, um, and, and I think, you know, that's kind of started my journey of, of generosity um, and really living a life with my hands wide open and uh, not only with my time but also my resources and, um, you know, I think that the mercy of God, he just told me, is I'm going to be abundantly merciful and I'm going to be abundantly generous with you. And if you trust me and you follow me, then I will follow through. I'm true to my word. And so, um, you know, a lot has changed since that day. You know, I, uh, you know I, I have a beautiful wife who is just absolutely perfect for me. I have four wonderful kids, a job I love, and a church that I love, and um, so, you know, the, the mercy of God is great, and, you know, although I, I probably deserved jail and, and maybe even an STD, um, you know, the mercy of God is, is absolutely great, and it's real, and, you know, I, I get to stand up here and be a testament, testimony to that, so thank you. Hey, good morning, Radiant Church. Uh, my name is David Klein, and I have the honor and the privilege to talk to you about the mercy of God and how it's impacted my life. In the first service, I had a meltdown, it seemed like. Um, I brought notes this time. So, but, so to tell you about the mercy of God in my life, I would like to tell you first about my need for mercy. Um, I was raised in a household where my mom uh, attempted to raise or did raise three boys with a crippling arthritis um, and no dad around. And in that, I, uh, I began at a very young age to run the streets and do what I wanted to do. Um, in my household, I intimidated my mom. I intimidated both my brothers. <coughs> I abused them uh, with threats of violence and violence at certain times. And I tried not to hurt them, you know, um, but I intimidated them. And, I, and that those emotional scars are... Uh, were real. So um, having that no authority and no uh, boundaries, I ran headlong straight into drugs and alcohol, uh, prim- uh, just all kinds of mess. I ran right straight into it, head first, uh, with no breaks, it seemed like. And so at the age of 12, I began to ex- experiment with drugs. And then at the age of 20, I got to experience uh, on stage addiction, uh, first stages of addiction. Uh, I went to my first drug treatment center in Wichita Falls, Texas. I'm from Dallas, Texas. And uh, 
yeah, I went there. I completed that program and immediately had abundant success. I went to a recovery program, a secular, secular recovery program. I believed in God. My mom taught me to believe in God. I believed in Jesus. I just didn't have a relationship with the Lord. And I did have a relationship with God, and I prayed to him. It just was, it was, it was, it, it just wasn't the same as what I have today. And so I asked him to keep me sober, and, and I began to, to uh, experience financial success. Um, I mean, just amazing success, and I got bored. At eight and a half months sober, I said, I'm going to a keg party because I was bored with the people in recovery, and I, I used that night, and it, it led to uh, a pattern of, of, of me getting sober for an amount of time and great success, and then more uh, debauchery. And, and, and so uh, at that time, in 1997, I was at the lowest of low. I hit a bottom like I never hit before. I completely... I just destroyed my life, and I was facing jail. I was facing death. They had diagnosed me with HIV and hepatitis C, and I was on probation, and here I got another charge, and I'm sitting in jail. My brother's going to prison. And the Lord, he came. My brother shared the gospel with me on the night he got out of prison. Um, and then uh, he went back to prison for a technical violation. And I got to watch that. But the Lord, he came and I, and I gave my life to him. And in that decision, there were some things he told me to do. I went through eight months of jail, county jail, ten months of rehab, and got out. And I began to compromise immediately. Started to compromise my walk, my sanctification with God. And I was stubborn. I didn't go to church like he said. Go to church, get plugged in. And I, I did a lot of other things. I went to lots of worship concerts. I went to lot church, lots of different church services. Some of the similar same church services and Bible study and did all these things, but I didn't get plugged in to the body of Christ. And I used, again, in 2002, I went head first right back into the addiction that God pulled me from. And I carried that for eight years trying to get back sober again, beating myself up. I took the best things that God had given me, and I used them for my own selfish gain. And the devil used that to beat me over the head with. And for eight years, I went through probably four or five more treatment centers, a couple of Christian discipleship programs. And finally, I came to California on my way to another program to visit my mom and meet my niece and nephew. And God had delivered me to a treatment program. I went. I had to go twice. But <laughs> I, I went, and I got out. And when I got out, I said, I'm going to church. I'm not going to make that mistake again. And so I went to church. Jared Turner invited me to come to Radiant Church, and I started coming here, and I started getting involved. We moved into a new building, and I started immediately getting involved and started doing different projects. Sean Bothwell was a friend of mine. I was washing his car, and, and the guy who, who owned the, the, his work truck gave me a job, and I got a job. I got a housing program, got off the streets, all right, and pretty much off my mom's couch. And, and, and under, from underneath, uh, I used to sleep in playgrounds and under bushes sometimes um, and in different places. Uh, and God was good to me, and uh, he has been good to me. He's delivered me from addiction. I'm almost nine years completely clean. And I was so nervous about this, trying to go. And we all need to do this. You all need to come up here and testify <laughs> about the mercy of God. And we'll tell you a week before, and then you need to, the whole week to prepare because this is, this is amazing to remember all that stuff. So he gave me a, a divine picture of his mercy, his grace in my life, and that's you guys, the body of Christ, Radiant Church. It's what I did not deserve, a family, the family of God, a citizen of heaven. I deserve punishment. I deserve hell. And he gave me heaven. He made me a citizen of heaven. God, I'm so grateful. We are your people. Help us to be grateful, Lord. Jesus, the mercy of God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, God. 
Hey, we wanted to end our time uh, together by enjoying uh, communion. Uh, the reason that those who deserved punishment have received mercy is because God made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf that we might become the righteousness of God. And his punishment has become our peace. Our sin was laid on him and now we receive the mercy of God in Christ. Before we come to the table, Daniel had a reminder for us out of uh, a couple of scriptures that he'll read. Yeah, I just felt two scriptures uh, back to back. Romans 5, therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him, we also obtained access access by faith into this grace in which we stand. Then in Hebrews chapter 4, it says, Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. And I just feel like this is a time of need. There's people in this room that are in a time of need. And there's no way out. There's no answers. You've exhausted them. And still there's accusations against you that's keeping you away from the throne of grace. And the scriptures are just coming like a sword to chop away all those lies. With confidence, come forward and access the throne of grace. And so, Lord, we just pray right now, Holy Spirit, you're able to save. You're able to give answers. Yeah, I just know there's a few people in the room that haven't given their life to the Lord. And his grace is coming right now to empower you to come forward and to receive grace. And then there's people... Also, just in a time of need that are saved but have kept themselves out and time out. And the Lord's saying, come out of time out. Come into the throne of grace with confidence and boldness. Come forward. So, Lord, would you do that? Would your Holy Spirit, we just agree with what you're doing. And we just thank you for your mercy and your grace. Amen. Thanks for listening. We want to be a resource for you as you walk with Jesus. So please connect with us at radiantvicelia.com. Until next time. There is a heavenly city that I'm compelled to find. Oh, I love the flowers and trees and the smell of the grinding sea. And all the beautiful things here in life And I am a pilgrim here on the side of the grave divide